I am pleased to announce the first speaker of the Seminar for Medical Nutrition Therapies for the Treatment of Epilepsy, Dr. Elizabeth Donner, who is a pediatric neurologist and who is, a leading, who is leading one of the biggest ketogenic diet program clinics in Canada in the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. The title of her presentation today is Classical Ketogenic Therapy, Where Are We in 2010? Good morning, uh, thank you. I have my slide. Um, <clears throat> good morning. Thank you so much for, uh, particularly to Margaret and Susie for arranging this day and um, inviting me to speak. I'm uh, very pleased to be here, happy to talk about diet therapies, very pleased to be joined by other speakers who know, um, who bring uh, other aspects uh, to our day today and I, I'm, I'm hoping everybody will really enjoy themselves. <clears throat> So, uh, sometimes when I give this talk, I call it brain food. So, um, we're all here because of a connection to epilepsy. And uh, for, if there's anybody in the crowd who doesn't know much about epilepsy, I can just tell you that it's a chronic condition character by, characterized by recurrent unprovoked seizures. And we all know this is an umbrella term, right? So epilepsy just means you have seizures, and a person with seizures can have a variety of associated conditions or just have seizures alone. But we do know that seizures affect about 1% of the population. Actually, I should say, I guess actually, the art um, that I've included in this uh, presentation is all from something called Expressions of Courage, which is a, Eric's nodding his head, it's a um, kind of art contest that is put on for people, adults and children with epilepsy, and they can submit their art, and they do display it online, and I've stolen it all off the website. But it, um, all the pictures that I've stolen were drawn by children, generally under the age of 15, or uh, certainly um, who have epilepsy. So we know epilepsy affects about 1% of the population, and in fact, uh, the incidence of epilepsy is highest in the youngest of the population. So up to 30% of, of epilepsy cases are diagnosed in childhood. So epilepsy in children is common and a problem that we need to address. And when we look at how we treat children with epilepsy, um, and adults for that matter, uh, the, the first treatment uh, that we consider is usually medication. And the reason for that is that um, the adverse effects of the other treatments that we offer are generally more dramatic or more dangerous than using medication first. And once uh, we try medication, medications will be effective in 70 to 75% of people to control their seizures. If medications aren't effective, then we consider either diet therapy or surgery. You can see that medications are, um, the first drug will be effective in about 48% of people to control seizures, and then uh, the second drug, if the first drug isn't effective, second drug used alone will be effective in about 13%. The third drug, at that point, if a person has failed to be controlled independently by two drugs, then the chance of a third drug being effective by itself is only about 1%. And uh, and a further 3% of people will be uh, controlled, will have seizures controlled with polytherapy or drugs used in combination. So what a slide like this or what these numbers help us to do is predict, first of all, that about, depending on the study you read, 25 to 35% of people with epilepsy won't have their um, seizures controlled by medication. And it also helps us when we talk to families to say, well, we should try one drug and we should try two drugs, but after we've tried two drugs, the chances that the seizures will come under control using drugs is very small. And so we need to, at that point, start thinking about other types of therapy. As I mentioned, up to a third of children with epilepsy have seizures that are not controlled by medication. I can't, um, just seeing if I can read what that child says here in her drawing of herself, and that's Megan, and she writes, I feel different with epilepsy, but some people tell me everyone is different in other ways, and that makes me feel a little better. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Sam. Sam's a real, Sam's his real name. Sam's a real boy. Christiana and I have looked after Sam, and you'll hear from Christiana later. And uh, his mom knows we talk about him, and Sam knows it too, so that's okay with him. 
So Sam is seven years old. He started having seizures when he was two. And uh, over a short period of time, his seizures turned into four types. He has generalized tonic-clonic seizures, and at that point, he was having them up to 10 times a day. He has hmm, uh, drop, or drop attacks or atonic seizures up to 50 per day. He has myoclonic jerks up to eight a day, and he has abson seizures where he just spaces out and he has these really on and off all day. And at the time when, when we met him, he was having constant seizures. By four years of age, here's the list of medications that Sam had been treated with and why they were either ineffective or caused an adverse effect. So he was first treated with carbamazepine, which actually caused some behavioral problems. And then he went on to be treated with clobazam and topiramine, but neither of those drugs were effective in treating his seizures. So at that point, he tried two drugs. They're the right types of drugs for the seizures he had, from what I know about his seizures and his EEG, and they weren't effective. So at that point, we, we know that Sam has medically intractable epilepsy, seizures not controlled by medication. Then he was tried on clonazepam, which also caused some behavioral difficulties. And phenobarb actually was the first drug that made some good effect, um, which previously probably wasn't tried because we worry about some of the side effects for phenobarb, but in Sam's case actually was the most effective to, to that time. And then, but because it wasn't completely effective, we added valproic acid. But at that point, he was on so many drugs that it was really hard to get the valproic acid level to a good range because the other medications were causing an increased breakdown of the valproic acid. So if I can get the video, please. This is actually Sam's mom, Mary, telling us a little bit about what his seizures were like. When we first came, Sam was having um, unstoppable seizures, up to one to 200 per day. He was constantly seizing, and he had a variety of types. He had the typical grand mal seizure where he convulsed for a good two minutes. Uh, he had a lot of drop seizures. Um, it looked as though someone had hit the back of his legs with a baseball bat, he would fall to the ground and hit his head. So we've had a lot of bumps and a lot of bruises. Um, he's had a lot of absence seizures where he would blankly stare off or the eyes would be fluttering. So constantly at any given moment he was having one of those types of seizures. So it was very hard to uh, find the real Sam. It was difficult. Anybody who knows children with intractable epilepsy knows that that's what it can be like really. Their whole life is really overtaken by these disabling seizures and I just think that uh, seeing Mary's, Mary's face and Mary's words, having her describe her son Sam, I think I find very moving. So uh, in general, with regards to epilepsy and seizures and sleeping, um, the brain actually, when it's asleep, is more likely to have the electrical disturbance that is associated with seizures. So some children, when they fall asleep, they have more seizures. Some children, they don't necessarily have more seizures, but if you were to do a brain recording during that time, an EEG, you would see that they have um, more electrical activity. And sleep is a big, a big, uh, concern, obviously, and obviously one of the concerns of parents um, is that their children could have seizures while they're sleeping and that that, that could be dangerous. Um, so um, a lot of families continue using, you know, the electronic baby monitors even into beyond when you would normally use them. And um, a lot of families sleep with their kids who have epilepsy. Um, that's something that I try to talk to families around, finding other ways to monitor their kids at night so that you're not sleeping with your kids as they're getting older because that has an effect on everybody in the household and their sleep um, and their privacy. So we try to talk about that, but it is a concern. Um, Sam, when he would be asleep, uh, he would be um, at risk of having the big shaking seizures, so the generalized tonic-clonic seizures at night. Um, and when he was young, I'm sure he slept with his mom, probably. It really affects quality of life, though, of everybody, right, because they're up all night. Actually, the, just talking about sleep and uh, kids and families, and we really know that uh, Epilepsy in children is special, perhaps um, presents more challenges even than epilepsy when we see it start in adults. Um, because childhood is a really vulnerable time. Uh, there's lots of things we need to get done when we're children. We need to uh, learn and develop, and childhood is vulnerable uh, developmentally, socially, and cognitively. And something like epilepsy can really throw those things off. Um, in fact, 
there's been some good studies looking at quality of life and, and uh, life outcomes in children with epilepsy. And we know that children with epilepsy are at an increased risk of mental health uh, issues, of uh, difficulty in social roles with their peers, within families, um, and of lowered self-esteem when compared to, even when compared to children with other chronic diseases like diabetes or asthma, children with epilepsy seem to be more vulnerable. Furthermore, furthermore, we know um, that people with epilepsy, even in adulthood, face challenges with employment, with relationships, um, and uh, with education. So coming back to Sam for a moment, um, Mary described what his seizures were like when he was around four years old there. So when Sam was six, um, he was having more attempts at treatment with medication. Um, and things were working on and off, but nothing completely. And then actually he came in to uh, see me and he was in something we called non-convulsive status epilepticus. So that's where the child is having continuous seizures, but they're not full body shaking seizures. They're more uh, subtle, like kind of staring spells type things, but really it's happening all the time. So even though he appears to be able to more or less walk around, or at least kind of be in the stroller and be taken places and stuff. He's not falling over and having big dramatic events. He's all day eye on and out, in and out of eye fluttering, and he's losing weight because he's not able, you know, kind of not able to eat. He's certainly not going to school and things like that. And that's an emergency. So we urgently assessed him for the diet, and we actually, I'm, I'm Christiana knows all the details, and I don't get into all the details here, but we experimented with a few different diets with Sam until we came upon the right type of diet for him. And three months after finding the right diet for Sam, um, he was actually seizure-free. He was still on the three medications that he came to us on, but he was seizure-free. And uh, at that three-month point, because we were worried that some of the um, Sedate, sedated state that he was in was also related to his meds. We started looking at weaning down the medication, first taking away the phenobarbital, and he really began to have really dramatic behavioral and cognitive improvements. Um, and uh, again, people who know Sam know now that uh, he was then seizure-free on just one medication plus the diet, and that we've now weaned him down to just a low-carbohydrate diet off the ketogenic diet because he was so developmentally, at that point, really developing fabulously. I've written here chapter books because he comes in now and reads a book usually when he comes to clinic, and that's really um, amazing for me. But uh, we did wean him off the diet uh, because, you know, he was at a developmental stage now where he didn't want to be on a special diet anymore, so he's just on a low-carbohydrate diet. He's doing great. So that brings me to talk about diets. And as the first speaker for today, I just put up a slide about the different diets that do exist generally, but my uh, other speakers today will touch on other diets. And really, I'm gonna talk about the classic ketogenic diet. But as you know, there's also a diet that utilizes medium chain triglycerides in the form of oil. There's the modified Atkins diet, which Dr. Kossoff will talk about in the low glycemic index diet treatment as well. So ketogenic diets uh, in general are uh, low carbohydrate, high fat, and adequate protein diets. And uh, I'm not really gonna get into me mechanism, although we know that we're essentially mimicking the body's uh, response to a state of starvation by limiting the amount of glucose uh, or carbohydrate that the body uses and substituting that with fat. And by doing that, uh, the breakdown product of fat is ketones, and so ketones become the main fuel for the body and for the brain. Um, Really, the anti-epileptic mechanisms aren't established, and there's some people in the room, including Dr. Mac Burnham, who are working hard to try and understand uh, how the ketogenic diet works. Um, but we do know that ketones and the production of ketones, which at our center we measure in the urine, um, do uh, often correlate with the effectiveness of the diet in controlling seizures. So even though it hasn't been established that ketones themselves are anti-seizure, the, if a child has more ketones, then they usually will um, have better seizure control.